Hi, this is Pastor Bob Yanyan. Today we're going to be talking about guidance from the life of Elijah. God had him move from here to there. That's the way guidance is. You move from place to place. Make sure you stay in the place long enough for God to tell you, now I want you to go there. We're going to take it up from the life of Elijah, talk about you and your place where God has called you. Let's go to the Word of God together. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and study the Word of God with Pastor Bob Yandian. Hello and welcome again to Student of the Word with Pastor Bob Yandian. Good to have you here today. If you'll open up your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 17, we'll get there in just a moment. Just want to mention to you again, those of you watching for the first time, Thanks for being here. Good to have you here today. And if you don't know much about me, well, I was a pastor for 33 years and I taught the word of God there. And before that, I taught at a Bible school. I still teach at Bible schools. But the thing that God has laid on my heart is to help raise up a generation of people that know the word of God. And today there seems to be across the country and really around the world is a drought of the word of God. And some churches are strong on the Holy Spirit. And I agree with that. I love the Holy Spirit. But there needs to be a balance in the church. But the main balance needs to be, it needs to be over weighted on the side of the Word of God, because anything the Holy Spirit does in our life, in filling of the Holy Spirit, gifts, signs, wonders, healings, all those are temporary. It's only as long as you live on this earth that you need healing. But what the Word of God is, is eternal. It lives and abides forever. We'll carry it to heaven with us. And so that's what's so important about bringing stability in life. So that's what this broadcast is dedicated to, is bringing you stability by understanding the Word of God. I'm going to get into guidance today. And guidance has to do with really a journey that God has given us. And everything in the Christian life is a journey. From the moment you get saved, you start on a journey toward growing up spiritually, toward discipleship. And Jesus mentioned in John chapter eight to those who just got saved, He said, now, if you continue in my word, then you'll be my disciples indeed, and you'll know the truth. The truth will make you free. Notice that word continue because it's a journey. Uh, Righteousness is a journey. Prosperity is a journey. In fact, the word for prosperity means to have a good trip. And so you start out this point, continue growing in the things of God. And so it is with the Christian life when it comes to to other things, you know, like uh, understanding God's word. There's a growth in that. and, And literally guidance is literally a trip. It is a progressive thing. And so I trust that tomorrow you'll be further along than you are today. And there's two words I'll be talking about today. The the name of this uh, today is called a place called there. But you're always being led from here to there. Once you get to there, it becomes here. Then here later on leads you to there and there becomes here once you arrive. And we're always being called from here to there. Yesterday here was there. I was here and God told me, he said, now I'm going to lead you over there. And this is what he did with Elijah. We're going to talk about that today because sometimes we get stuck here and we don't want to get out of here. And God has a there for us. And so just like our, our daily walk with God is a trip a journey, a progressive place from here to there, and then from there to there to there to there. Again, we're going to talk about that from uh, Elijah's ministry and talk about guidance. Uh, What we're going to find out today is that God told Elijah while he was speaking to him, he said, return back to that still small voice. Really, guidance, when we often talk about the Lord spoke to me, and I use that term quite often, it just suddenly struck me one day, I need to define that. Because when I say the Lord spoke to me, it's people think it's an audible voice. And I really don't know that many people in the Christian life, minister friends that I've had and have, that really have ever heard God's audible voice. Some have. But in the case of even the word of God, not that many actually heard the audible voice of God. Mainly it comes back to that inward voice that cannot be heard with the ear. The still small voice is an inward knowing. It's not even like God talks to me on the inside. He just drops thoughts on the inside of me. And so a knowing an understanding without an audible voice. I like to tell people this, if I explain something to you, then you know it. But what if you could know it without me explaining it to you? That's how God speaks. I still used to have a knowing inside. There was not this voice describing everything to me. I just suddenly knew. There's times I've been here and God led me there. And one of those here's I was at was, at, was uh, working at a, at a job and God led me to another job and that was working with Kenneth Hagin Ministries. 
I didn't know why, but I just knew I was supposed to be there. From the time that the lady answered the phone on the other end, I called about a job opening. And she said, Kenneth Hagin Ministries, I knew on the inside of me that job belonged to me. I knew God was leading me there. It wasn't like God said, I am leading you there. I just knew I was gonna be there. So I ended up being there. Then from there, I knew later on when they announced and I was working there, they were gonna start Rama Bible Training Center. I knew on the inside of me, I was gonna be there. I was here working in the audio department. I'm gonna be there teaching at the school. And later on, I was there for four years. And the fourth year I was there, the Lord spoke to me and said, you're gonna pastor the church that you're in. And that was not an audible voice. I just knew on the inside of me, I would be pastoring the church. I was attending that my wife and I helped begin. We didn't actually uh, preach to begin it. We just started working there. We joined that church. The moment we were there, the first Sunday it began. And we just knew that's where we were supposed to be. And we loved it. So, but one day the Lord spoke to me and I ended up being the third pastor of that church. The first pastor was there for five years, the next one for a year and a half, and I took over after that. I just knew it. And so I, even when the board didn't know who was gonna have the church, I knew on the inside of me. But it was that, it was again, just that sudden knowing on the inside. That's how God speaks. And we find this throughout the word of God. And here in this story of Elijah, it is called a still small voice. Look with me here at 1 Kings 17. I wanna read the first 10 verses. Here it says, Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, as the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years except at my word. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, get away from here and turn eastward and hide at the brook Cherith. Notice, get away from here. Where is here? Standing here before the king, standing here in the uh, king's throne room. And he says, get away from here and turn eastward and hide at the brook Cherith. What the Lord was telling him was, is that it's about time that you understand this king's gonna come after you and he's gonna search for you. But I'm gonna, if you'll go there, I will hide you there. Get away from here and turn eastward and hide by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. This all came by that still small voice, the inward voice of God. And it shall be that you shall drink from the brook and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. I want you to notice something. I've already commanded the ravens to feed you there. In other words, Elijah, the birds are headed there. You need to go there because if you don't get there, the birds will circle looking for you because I've already commanded them to go there. So it says in verse five, so he went and did according to the word of the Lord, for he went and stayed at the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. And it happened after a while that the brook dried up. I want you to notice it wasn't drying up, it dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. So he arose and went to Zarephath. Notice again, he started out with here, the throne room, and went to there, which was the mountain. On the mountain, God said, go away from here and go there, and you're gonna live there for a while, and there's a widow there that's gonna take care of you. It's time to go from here to there. Remember again that at... Uh, the place he was on the mountain there and being fed by the ravens was called there. But he'd been there long enough at there to where there became here. And God said, now go from here to there. So he went there and God was gonna take care of him. This is your Christian life and this is what guidance is. Guidance simply means you are never in one place for a long time, all right? Maybe, again, you might be at a church. I was in church for 33 years, but I was never there the whole time. You say, what do you mean by that? It was a constant changing from year to year that the, even though I was in the physical place, yet the things God had me do was different to where the church was almost unrecognizable as what I took when I first began. There was actually a growing process in that. We moved from one a piece of property to another piece of property, but I still remain the pastor of the church. And then in 2013, the Lord told me that I was gonna leave from here and go to there, and there is the ministry that I have today. And this ministry is constantly changing. Even though you arrive at there, it's never exactly the same thing. It changes from day to day because again, God constantly has a calling on your life that keeps changing and moving on, and you don't recognize yourself today. You might live in the same house, you might drive the same car, but you're not the same person that bought that car 10 years ago. You're not the same person who bought that house 15 years ago. You are, your life has drastically changed during that time because God is constantly moving you, moving you, moving you, and it's moving you into a fuller maturity. Sometimes that takes a location change. Other times you stay in the same spot, but you yourself change 
as you follow into the ministry. Elijah's public ministry began on Mount Carmel. This is before the time that God spoke to him and said, go from here to there. He had been on Mount Carmel and Elijah challenged the prophets publicly and saw fire fall with the multitudes. And then he slew 400 prophets of Baal. This is not the same uh, man that was before. I mean, he has grown tremendously. And in his personal life, he has grown. We see him moving from here to there. But in his personal life, he is growing. And he slew 400 prophets of Baal. He saw all the people repent and turn back to God. Elijah pronounced the end of the drought. And it suddenly rained hard. And Elijah outran Ahab's chariot. And so here we again, we come back to it, is He's having tremendous victories one after another. As he moved from the, from the throne room there and went up to the mountain, then from the mountain he went to live at uh, Zarephath where the woman was. We find him changing and changing and location changes actually indicated to there was a growth process in his life until after three and a half years, he stood in front of the king and announced that this thing was over. And then on the mountain again, as he was there on Mount Carmel, then all of a sudden, man, it started to rain hard when he came down. This is the time when Elijah outran Ahab's chariot. Ahab was headed back toward the throne room and he saw the thunder coming, saw the lightning coming, saw the clouds coming, knew that was coming. And then Elijah just picked up the skirts of his garments and ran faster than Ahab's chariot. We find the anointing of God all, all over him. I mean, this is true. Think, put yourself in that position. How would you like a ministry like that where so much visible manifestation of God's power is upon you? And this is what happened with Elijah. He is now the hero of the nation. The nation fell down in front of him, not worshiping him, but repenting before God for their attitude toward God. And believe me, Ahab and Jezebel had a tremendous setback at this time, but they will not change. They are still fighting God, fighting Elijah, fighting the miraculous, fighting the will of God to get their own will across. But the, this, this great manifestation of God has swayed the whole nation and the whole nation is now turned back and Elijah slew all those prophets of Baal in front of their eyes. We have a man here that is doing great exploits for God, but I want you to mark this down. We are often prone to a defeat immediately after a great victory. And this is what happened with Elijah, this great victory that was still rolling across in his mind. The next morning after he woke up, there was a knock at the door and there was on the, on the doorstep, a servant of the queen and handed him a note and that guy left and he opened up the note and here's what the note said. By tomorrow, you're gonna be dead just like all those prophets or I'm gonna kill you. She didn't mean it. She was scared. The queen was afraid of him, this national hero, because she was also afraid of the God that stood behind Elijah. And she sent this note hoping to scare him and guess what? It worked. Here he was, he, before this, he stood up in front of 450 prophets of Baal and killed them all. And now he's gonna run from a note from the queen. If she really meant to kill him, she would have sent someone with a dagger, not someone with a note. And the note scared him so much he started running. And that's where our story really comes today. Again, we're often prone to a defeat immediately after a great victory. I'll see you right after halftime, right after the break, and you'll find out how you can have some materials that's gonna help you come to a greater understanding of the will of God for your life. Christians often ask, how can I know the voice of the Lord? Or how do I get His guidance? Pastor Bob Yandian's series, Guidance, will help set you on the right path to hearing from God and knowing what comes from Him and what doesn't. We often make the mistake of wanting God to lead us by wonders and outward signs, when the vast majority of His guidance actually comes through the Word of God and the still small voice of the Holy Spirit. We must come to understand that we do not have the ability to guide ourselves, just as we do not have the ability to save ourselves or heal ourselves. Guidance explores the sevenfold ministry of the Holy Spirit and examines in detail the two ways God leads His children. To order the Guidance series, visit our website at bobyandian.com. Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit bobyandian.com and click on Partnership. 
Theology Simplified is a practical guide to foundational biblical truth. Basic doctrines are not difficult, but easy to understand. They often become disguised as complicated or deep-sounding words, but the definitions are simple. Pastor Bob makes complex theological concepts clear and practical. Eight crucial doctrines are demystified. Redemption, justification, sanctification, reconciliation, predestination, election, propitiation, and glorification. These eight precepts, essential for all believers to understand, come to light as you read and arrive at a deeper understanding of the finished work of Jesus Christ. To order Theology Simplified, visit our website at bobyandian.com. We are often prone to a great defeat after a great victory. We see this throughout the Word of God. Moses stood there in front of the people and water came out of a rock, and yet he turned around to the people and chewed them out. God didn't say chew the people. I didn't even say speak to the people. He said speak to the rock. And he didn't speak to the rock. He hit it and beat it out of anger. But you know, after 40 years of being with those people, I probably would have lost my temper too. Well, he did, and it kept him from going into the promised land. But again, we're often prone to a defeat immediately after a great victory. And so this is what happened with Elijah after calling down fire from heaven and after slaying the prophets of Baal. And then all of a sudden now the drought is over, the rain has come back and he ran back home, outran Ahab's chariot, the anointing of God, the power of God was all over him. He finally got back to his place where he was staying and the next morning was met by a servant of the queen. And she had this man had a note in his hand that said she was going to kill Elijah just like he had killed the prophets. And he suddenly became afraid and notice what happened. It says here, he ran for his life. God made Elijah at that time a supernatural cake with supernatural water. And Elijah ran for 40 days in the strength of the cake and the water. Let's read the story. First Kings chapter 19, we're gonna take a look at verses four through 13, because this takes up and at this point right here, Elijah is carnal. Up until that time, he had been spiritual. But now because of the fear that came upon him, because of that note, he ran for his life when he didn't need to. God was the protector of his life. But the beauty of it is, is God's compassion on him was tremendous. But God is long suffering, not infinite suffering. We're going to find out that once that Elijah, probably tired after all these years and probably tired and saw all the people fall in front of him. He probably thought the queen would repent, the king would repent, but they did not. And when he saw that they became more hardened in their attitude toward him, it caused discouragement to come on him, fear to come on him, and he's literally going to run for his life. In 1 Kings 19, verses four through 13, it says, he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He ran for a full day and came and sat down under a juniper tree and he prayed that he might die and said, it is enough now, Lord, take my life. I am no better than my father's. I love this story. You know what it starts out saying here? The queen said she was going to kill him. So he ran for his life, fell down under a tree. And the first thing he said was, Lord, I wish I was dead. He didn't mean it. He was looking for pity. He was looking for something from God. And now he's using that pity to try to worm something out of God. He said, Lord, take my life. I am no better than my father's. And literally, he didn't really say for the Lord to take his life, you know, because again, if he wanted to die, he could have stayed home. The queen said she would kill him, but he didn't do that. So he ran down and says to God, now you take my life. I'm no better than my father's. Look at verse five. Then as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, rise and eat. This is probably the Lord Jesus Christ. This is probably the angel of the Lord. And he looked, it says in verse six, and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, arise and eat because the journey is too great for you. So he arose and ate and drank. And he went in the strength of that food for 40 days and 40 nights as far as Horeb, the mountain of God. Here's the interesting thing is that God in his mercy and God in his grace and God in his compassion for this carnal prophet did great things for him in grace, but his hope was and his purpose was so that Elijah would turn around and go back to where he was supposed to. He left here before God gave him a there. He was back there in that city and now he ran for his life without a, pro without an, uh, without a command from God. 
and not telling him where to go. Before this time, whenever he was here, God would say, go there. He was there for a while. And then all of a sudden, God said, now leave from here and go to there. And now he has run from God without any command at all. So again, he ran. And in the strength of that food, in the strength of that water, which was supernatural, he ran for 40 days. Notice this, before that, he ran for one day and fell down under a juniper tree tired. Now he eats this small cake and drinks that supernatural water that God gave him. He runs for 40 days in the strength of it. Man, I'd love to have the, the, uh, you know, the recipe for that thing. That'd be great. But again, he ran for 40 days and he came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Here's the interesting thing. All the strength that he took from that, he ran in the wrong direction. He didn't run back to where God wanted him to, which was back to the place of where the, the kingdom was, where the king's palace was, where he was supposed to be, where he's supposed to be influencing government. He did not go back there because he didn't understand this. The king was now in great reverence toward Elijah, great fear of Elijah, knowing the power that he had, knowing he'd swayed the nation. And this king was striving for everything he could and all that they could do is threaten to kill him, but they were afraid of him. But now Elijah's running from people that are afraid of him, looking for his own place, trying to find his own place, his own will, when he hasn't heard from God. Up until now, he has been very obedient not to move until he has heard from God. So it says in verse nine, once he got to Horeb, running in the wrong direction, he was supposed to run back to his ministry, not further away from it. And he ran as far away from it as he could. And in verse nine, then he went into a cave and spent the night there in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? You should be there, Elijah. What are you doing here? In other words, he's manufacturing his own guidance and he's going under his own will, not with God's will. And so he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword, and I am left alone and they seek my life. Then he said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. So the Lord spoke to him and said, get out of this cave and go and stand in front of the Lord. Here's the interesting thing. He's feeling so sorry for himself. I'm the only one. I'm the one serving you. I mean, there has just been now the whole nation bowed before him. And he said, I'm the only one left serving you. Now they're after my life. Another thing God's gonna tell him also is there's 7,000 out there that haven't bowed their knee. In other words, you may think you're the only one, but God's simply saying they're all hidden back there. They're in homes or in Bible schools or other places. And believe me, there's 7,000 out there who have not bowed their knee. Don't you dare think you're the only one serving me, that you're the only one. And now he's trying to twist God's arm I don't know if you wanted another cake or what, but he was trying to get something out of God. You ought to feel you ought to feel proud of me. I'm the only one. And on top of that, your will would fall apart without me. How many ministers have I heard say that? And Elijah right now is using that excuse. Boy, God, you really need me. So in verse 11, God says to him, go and stand on the mountain in front of the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains, broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. And so it was when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in the mantle, went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. And suddenly a voice came to him saying, what are you doing here, Elijah? Twice, the Lord said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah tried to break a brand new there and make it here, and he was out of God's will. He belonged back there because he had not finished what God asked him to do back there in the place where the government was, the king was, the queen was. He was not back there where he belonged. And what we find here is twice. And finally, the second time, he says exactly the same thing in those verses of scripture. And finally, the Lord says to him, what are you doing here? And that's when God said, okay, Elijah, it's over. I've got someone else to take your place. You understand that what this verse is saying? This verse is simply saying this, if you won't fulfill the will of God that God has called you to do, he'll get someone else to do it. The most important thing is not you. The most important thing is God's will being done. And if you turn it down, God will get someone else to do it. The most important thing is not you. And you suddenly get this idea, I'm the important one. No, the will of God is the important one. From the day of Pentecost, God handed a baton to those 120 that were the upper room and they handed it on to somebody else and handed it on to somebody else. And the word of God that's been handed to you actually started back there at the time of Adam and Eve, was not written till the time of Moses and the New Testament was handed to us by the 120 in the upper room. And we've had a baton we have handed on. We run our race and hand the baton on to someone else. And the important person is not the runner. The important thing is the baton. 
It is the unchangeable word of God, the will of God. And here he has been handed, Elijah has been handed this baton from prophets before him. And now they hand it to him. He suddenly is griping and complaining. I'm the only one, there's no one to hand this off to. There's no one out there. And God said, yes, there is. There's 7,000 out there that have not bowed their knee. He says, now Elisha is gonna replace you. And when he found Elisha, he told him, You'll, he'll be plowing with 12 yoke of oxen. You know what this is saying? I'm gonna replace you with a farmer. Elijah, you think I'm gonna take somebody special that your ministry is so big and so huge, it's gonna take somebody special to take your ministry? He said, I'll replace you with a farmer. God is always in the business of taking nobodies and making somebodies out of them. And Elijah was the same way. Elisha is gonna be the same way. Elijah's ministry was in Jerusalem and Judah. He was at Cherith. Then after a while, God sent him, to, uh, was sent by God to a woman in Zidon, Gentile territory, who had faith to be fed in time of drought and famine. At the brook and at Zidon, he was in God's will, even though God sent him into difficult times. In each case, provision was sent by God ahead of time to the place he would go. He stayed at each place until God told him to move, even though the provisions had dried up. If times are difficult, don't move until you hear from God. Look at, the, look at the faith of Elijah. The brook had already dried up. By the time a brook is drying up, we usually are looking for a new place to go. He stayed there even when the brook had dried up and he was sucking dust. And all of a sudden, then God said, now it's time to move. He didn't move till God told him to. But in this particular case, as soon as that note came, he ran as fast as he could and he tried to convince God he did the right thing. If you jumped too quickly, go back to the last place God spoke to you and the last place you knew you were in his will. If you're stopping right now and don't know what to do, ask yourself a question. What's the last thing God told me to do? Am I still there? The, if the answer is no, then get back there. What Elijah should have done was gone back to where his will was, where God's will was, where his ministry was, and God would have taken care of him. God has never led Elijah by a wind or an earthquake, but by the inward voice. And what he's looking for now is some supernatural thing. And God is simply saying, Elijah, he said, understand this. He said, I've never led you this way, but now you're asking for a wind, earthquake, all these other things. I've always led you by the still small voice. It's self-pity that's driving Elijah to look for the spectacular instead of looking for the usual means of the supernatural. And here's the point, how often do we miss the supernatural because we're looking for the spectacular? And oftentimes the supernatural is just that still small voice on the inside telling you what to do next. It's just as supernatural as wind, as a tornado, as an earthquake, but the beauty of it is this is how God guides most of us. 99% of your guidance is gonna be that once in a great while you might have a supernatural thing on the outside, a spectacular thing on the outside that will lead you and guide you. But Elijah is not the only one who has not bowed to Baal. Again, until that time, he said there's 7,000 out there that have not bowed their knee. So until now, Elijah has always moved from here to there. Now, Elijah ran from there to here, and God did not tell him to do this. So I simply ask a question, is things right in your life? Perhaps you're not in the there that God has told you to. I'm asking you the same question. What are you doing here? Find out in your heart where you're supposed to be. That's where the blessings are. See you next time. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. Visit bobyandian.com. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.